I'm very pleased and honored to be asked to make this talk because I have a link with Kazakhstan. My son has married a Kazakhstani woman. Um, so I've, I've been to Kazakhstan, I've been to Almaty and I enjoyed my, my trip there. I want to make a point about my background. Although I've spent recent years in university, I started out as a school teacher. So I've been there in a secondary school teaching mathematics to um, adolescent boys, uh, which was an interesting and often quite difficult experience. So I have a real sense of what it's like to be in a classroom. And thirdly, uh, as an introductory remark, I'm going to say very little about chat GPT. Others in your series will talk about that. What I want to do is to give a sense of where AI in education has come from that we are now at the point that we are. Next slide, please. So my talk uh, is in several parts. I'm going to say something about what is AI in education. I'll give a little history of it. I'm, I'll talk about generic strengths of it. I'll give some examples of systems that have been developed over time. And I'll talk about the teacher role in using those systems. They don't replace the teacher, they assist the teacher. I'll mention the evaluations of the effectiveness of these kinds of tools. And I'll briefly talk about ethics and generic dangers of AI at the end. Next slide, please. So AI in education typically is organized around three different kinds of system. The first kind are aimed at learners. And the things that they can do, for example, are to adapt the sequence or the content or the present presentation of tasks to the learner state, what they know, how they feel, what they're interested in, how they learn. So it can make adjustments to the way the material, the tasks, etc., are actually experienced by the learner. And they can provide a whole variety of tools for learning, including tools for learning about learning. The second category of system are those that are focused on the teacher. They can do things like help offload some of the routine work of the teacher so that the teacher can spend more time on things that only the teacher, the human teacher can do. They can also help and assist the teacher to better understand their students and how best to allocate her time to which students need it most. And the third kind of system of AI in education are essentially aimed at administrators within the educational system at whatever level, university, school, or whatever. To, for, to, for example, manage the overall student progress, generate early warning signals, perhaps be involved in admissions of the student to the organization. Next slide, please. So traditionally, uh, and looking at learner-centered AI ed, where was the AI? Well, the AI was in three particular places. First of all, the system had some kind of model of the domain knowledge that it was trying to teach. So if it was teaching maths, it needed to be able to understand and solve maths problems. It also needed to have pedagogical knowledge in terms of how to, how to teach, 
how to answer questions, how to ask questions, how to enthuse the student, and how to make sure that the interaction went smoothly. And together, these were used to build a model of the student. So in my diagram here, if you look on the right-hand side, you see a rather gray student with a smile on, his, on their face. And inside the rectangular block, which is the conceptual architecture of the system, we see a paler model of the student who's not smiling. The paler model will always be imperfect. This is being built by the system, but it tries to capture what it understands about the student that it's trying to teach. Or if it's trying to teach a group of students, understand a little bit about the group of students. So, it, so it's the system's understanding of the student or students that it's trying to teach. And the fourth component is the interface through which the interaction with the human student or students actually takes place. Next slide, please. So in order to give you a sense of the history or a little bit of the history of artificial intelligence in education, I've got this sort of wiggly timeline going from 1970, yes, 1970, um, up until relatively recently, 2019, I just before chat GPT became well known and indeed popular. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I can't, I don't have time in this talk to, to describe all of the highlights. So I'm going to take uh, four, the Carbonell's system called Scholar, the cognitive tutors, which have gone under other names too, uh, from uh, 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 initially produced by Anderson, uh, the learning by teaching system called Betty's Brain, produced by Gautam Biswas, uh, uh, an orchestration system, which is a teacher-centered system, by Ken Holstein, and ENSC, the N-Skill language tutors by Lewis Johnson. So this kind of, just this line gives you a sense that AI has been involved in education for um, more than 60 years, sorry, more than 50 years. Um, so it's not new. I mean, what's happened recently is that chat GPT has become very well known, causing a lot of concern in education, but it's it's a kind of a culmination in a way of a lot of other things which have happened. So th so my my overall goal is to give you a better sense of all these other things that have happened leading up to Chat G GPT. Next slide, please. And of course, AI itself has changed. So in the early days, in in <clears throat> in the last century. Most AI was symbolic AI, where human programmers built programs that tried to produce intelligent behavior in their teaching systems. Uh, I guess since around 1990 onwards, machine learning has become a dominant paradigm within AI. And for many people today, they equate AI with machine learning, but they're not the same. Machine learning is a branch of AI um, and not the only branch. There's also symbolic AI. And of course, with chat GPT, we have another branch, which is, is machine learning, but it's about generative AI, AI used to make stuff up, whether it be text or whether it be pictures or whether it be programs. Next slide, please. So this is uh, the dialogue that the scholar program would have with a student. It was very simple minded. So I'll just read it out. So the computer. 
the language in Brazil is French, right or wrong? The student says, wrong. The computer says, you're correct. The language of Brazil is Portuguese. Is it true that the capital in Brazil is Brasilia? Student says, yes. Student, tell me something about Peru. The computer says, wait a minute, I'm checking my files. Let's proceed now. Peru is a country, it's in South America. The population is approximately 7 million people. The capital is Lima. Computer, now answer the question you didn't answer before. So it's a very simple-minded dialogue. It's about geography. It didn't need to be about geography. You could put in any other domain you liked. It could be another ge geographical domain. It could all be about Kazakhstan, for example, rather, rather than about South America. Um, because the system used a representation as its domain knowledge of a semantic net, which uh, human programmers had put together, which encapsulated knowledge about different countries in South America, the language, the area, the size of the country, the capital of the country was all coded in a semantic network. And although I read out this dialogue, the interaction was through a keyboard and a, and a screen. This is, this is happening, 1970 is prior to personal computers, prior uh, to a lot of the things that we, uh, certainly prior to the internet, and uh, prior to a lot of things we take for granted now. But this system uh, could have a reasonably good, uh, not exactly a conversation, it could ask questions as we can see in the upper part of the, of the, uh, the dialogue, but it could also answer questions as shown in the bottom part of the dialogue. Because the reason why it could answer questions was because it had a representation of the knowledge which the student could ask about. Of course, if the student asked about something else, it wouldn't be able to answer it. But so long as they were asking a question that was already in, that, whose answer was already encoded in the semantic network, then it could answer it. So it's very simplified English. It's not as good as a chatbot these days, and certainly not as good as chat G GPT, but it could ask and answer questions. So its knowledge of teaching was quite simple. Ask a question or answer a question was basically its two, its two skills. And you'll note at the bottom of the dialogue, it had recognized that it had asked a question, um, uh, which was a prox, what is the population in Brazil about halfway down? And the student hadn't answered it. So it kind of kept track of the conversation. Now answer the question you didn't answer before. So this is 1970. Next slide, please. So just looking at this diagram again, the domain knowledge, what it knew about geography was uh, based on a semantic network. Its tutorial capability was to ask and answer questions. It had a very imperfect understanding of the student uh, in as much as it kept a record of which bits of the semantic network had been answered correctly, which had been answered incorrectly, and what questions the student had asked. So it had a vague sense of what the, the human student had already understood about the geography of South America and by adding tags into the semantic network. So as the conversation proceeded, it would add more tags and gradually build up a more accurate model, um, a model of the student's understanding. Next slide, please. So I'm now going to move on to the second example, the cognitive tutors 
uh, produced by Anderson and Koeniger and many others too. Next slide. So these tutors um, are now being used to a huge extent, uh, largely in the USA, but around the world. Um, they started in Carnegie Mellon. Um, they have uh, capabilities for teaching a whole range of different subjects, but the most famous ones have tended to be uh, maths. Um, and the current version of the Cognitive Tutor for Maths is called Mathia. Um, and they've also produced uh, uh, tutors for languages and also for computer science. And uh, this slide is from Steve Ritter, who is part of the team which uh, designs, develops, and markets the cognitive tutors. Next slide, please. This is a screenshot from Mathia. Now I know that the, 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 it's quite small to read. It doesn't really matter that you, you can't read, but basically the student is posed a question, which you can see in the middle of the screen with a, a, a yellow bar above it. And then they have a number of tools which they can use to try to work their way through the various steps of uh, answering the question. And they have a graph uh, on the right-hand side of the screen where they might want to plot a graph. So the interaction uh, is much more visual than, uh, than Scholar because computer technology has progressed dramatically since, the, since, since 1970. Next slide, please. So what are the roles of AI here? Well, it selects the next best problem for that student. It looks at how well the student has been able to solve um, the problem so far, and it will note that it solved some, partially solved others, completely failed on others again. And because it's got a model of the skills that underpin solving, this is, this is for algebra, the, the underpin algebra, it's able to say, well, okay, we can infer from the history of the student that certain of the skills seem to be mastered, others definitely seem to be not mastered, and others, again, it's unclear about whether they have been mastered or not been mastered. So the question is, what would be the next best problem for the student? Well, clearly, the next best problem wouldn't be one which is contains or which requires only skills which the student has, has got no capability, nor should it be one where the student has mastered all of the skills. It needs to be a mixture of the skills that the student already can, can, uh, has mastered and ones which they're trying to master. So it works its way looking through the problems to find a problem that fits that particular recipe. The next thing that it can do is because the problems are they're algebraic problem, problems, multi-step problems, it can provide help at each step within the problem. It's not that it asks the student to solve the problem when they're finished, it checks the answer and can say right or wrong. It looks at every step which the student makes. And if the student makes a step that looks pretty much like a step that it already knows is a good step, it'll keep quiet because there's nothing to be said. If the student makes a step that looks, uh, that is known to be a, a wrong step, it can step in at that step, not wait till the answer is produced and say, look, I think you're not going in the right direction here. Of course, sometimes students do things which it has got no idea about at all in which case it has to then give some more general advice because it doesn't really completely understand why the student actually did the thing that he or she did. 
and it can provide feedback on the progress of the underlying skills. So the system has what has become to be known as a skillometer, which shows progress on the various algebraic skills. And each time that the student successfully solves a problem, the, the amount uh, shown on the skillometer goes up a bit on all the skills that have been involved in that particular problem. Next slide, please. So what about the human teacher? Well, the human teacher has got several things that they need to do. Well, first of all, they need to motivate the students and set goals and expectations before they even play with the, the online tutor. Um, they need to be persuaded that actually working with the online tutor is going to be effective and helpful. And they've also got to set expectations of the student to say, OK, you may have some problems with the interface or you may not. You can always ask. You can ask the tutor, but they may not be able to answer. You can always ask me. So the teacher needs to set themselves up as the as the resource uh, who can help if things don't go as planned. Then the teacher needs to, to orchestrate and, and manage the student activity with the system. Is it going to be one student with the system? Is it going to be a pair of students working with the system? Is it going to be a little group working with the system? Each of those has different advantages and disadvantages. And the teacher will know best whether a single student or a pair of students or a group of students are best suited to get the maximum benefit from using the system. The teacher also needs to structure and manage the interaction with the system, making sure that everybody is working effectively um, and not just stuck um, or uh, confused or indeed bored. And then when the students stop using the system to get the maximum benefit, there needs to be some management of the students to get them to reflect on and to think about and to discuss what went well, what didn't go well, what they think they've learned, what they think they haven't learned uh, with, this, with the, the tutor, with the online tutor. So here we've got two roles. We've got the tutor, which is doing some effective individual if, uh, or group tutoring on algebra. And you've got the teacher who is organizing and orchestrating that interaction and making sure that the, two, the students are properly prepared for it and also afterwards think about it and reflect on it in an effective kind of way. Next slide, please. The builders of the cognitive tutors have, have always been really keen to try to make the tutor fit well into existing classrooms. Um, so they've designed a blended core maths curriculum, blended in the sense of human teaching as well as system teaching. And they've produced a variety of resources uh, to help the teacher, including a textbook. So it's not a, a case of the, the children being put in front of the, of the system and the teacher doing nothing, the teacher's in deeply involved and can, uh, can move seamlessly between a textbook, whole class teaching, individual teaching, using the, and using the tutor individually or for whole class or for small group. So it's, 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 it's made to fit and they made it fit by talking to teachers, which is really, really important in order to find out what works and what doesn't work. And over the years, they have made it fit better into the system than it did at the very beginning. Next slide, please. So let me take you now to learning by teaching. This is one of my favorite applications of AI in education. 
Next slide, please. This is a system called Betty's Brain. Uh, and Betty is the blonde character down in the left hand corner of the slide. The domain here is the ecology of a river system. And initially you can see uh, on the major part of the, of the screen contains a network. Now the human student starts off with no network there and the story of this, of how this tutor is used is that their job is to teach Betty about ecology. So Betty down in the left there starts off effectively with an, with an empty knowledge about ecology. And the human student needs to build that network. For example, talking about how oxygen affects things, how carbon dioxide is produced and affects other things, how weed grows or doesn't grow, et cetera, et cetera. And the human student has got resources. There are some videos and a textbook where they can learn about ecology and they use a drag and drop interface to produce a network like that, like the one we can see. Let me just go, can we just go to the next slide temporarily, please? So this, this shows the same network, uh, uh, just blown up a little bit. So for example, uh, plants are a type of algae, plants use carbon dioxide, uh, uh, animals produce carbon dioxide. Uh, fi uh, 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 fish are a type of animals. Uh, animals produce waste. Waste produces bacteria. So th these are essentially binary relationships between different entities. Can we now go back a slide? So the, the human student builds, builds the network for Betty. So at this point, Betty has some knowledge in the network built by the human student. Now, it may be that the human student is very, very good and has, correct, has built a correct network. More than likely, the human student hasn't completely understood about ecology and has built a poor network with, with things missing or errors in it. So the human student can ask the system, indeed, uh, uh, there's a teacher involved, it, there's a, uh, uh, a, an online teacher here, can ask for the network or indeed for Betty to be tested on how good her knowledge is, her knowledge being given to her by the human student. If, if Betty passes the test, all is good and the, the st human student can build some more. If Betty fails the test because the network wasn't built well, then of course this, the human student can think, well, you know, Betty got it wrong, not really me, but I can probably do a bit better. So the human student gets some advice from the internal teacher of the system saying, this bit of the network wasn't quite right. You left out this other thing. You've got this bit in twice, etc. So then the, 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 the human student can then edit the network, make it a bit better, and get uh, Betty to be tested again to see whether, in fact, more has been understood. Okay, can, we, can you go over, uh, skip the slide we've already seen and go to the one after that, please? So, as I said, the system uh, contains a teacher agent, Mr. Davis, uh, and Mr. Davis provides feedback about how well the network has been built. 
But Mr. Davis also does something else. Mr. Davis always provides, also provides metacognitive advice. So for example, if the, if the human student produces a network, asks for it to be tested, then, and, and gets a poor mark for it, and then makes no change, and then asks for it to be tested again, they're gonna get the same poor mark. If that happens, Mr. Davis says, well, look, it's no good just giving me the same answer. You, it was wrong the first time and it'll be wrong the second time. So you need to make some changes. I think you should go and look at some of the resources that are available in the system and see if you can do better the next time. So, th so there's, a, there's an interaction here, both at the cognitive level and at the metacognitive level. Next slide, please. So the human teacher roles in this are very much the same as for the cognitive tutor. The human teacher has to motivate the students and set goals and expectations, has to manage the prior student activity before they use Betty's brain, needs to structure and manage the interaction with the system. Maybe it'll be one student working with it or several students, um, and also needs to manage the post-student activity and reactions. What did you learn? What didn't you learn? What did you find difficult? What did you find easy? In order to help the student reflect on their learning, which is absolutely a crucial activity in learning, to reflect on it, to be able to understand what it is that you understand and what it is that you don't yet understand. Next slide, please. So I'm now going to jump forward a little bit further to orchestration systems. Next slide. Okay, uh, I've got my, I got the order on. I'll stick with this one. So this is this is Nskill, um, which is a system uh, to uh, teach English. So it makes all of the use of uh, modern interface technology. The, it, uh, it, it doesn't have to be English, but the, the example I have is for, is for learning English for foreign students. So the student sits at a terminal, has a microphone and headphones. At, on the screen of the terminal is an avatar. I think in this case, pretending to be somebody who, a travel agent who the human student interacts with about buying tickets for uh, some event or other or for, or for to go on a train. So the interaction is not like the early days typed, it's spoken. The student speaks in the language that they're trying to learn, the teacher responds in the language which they're trying to learn and gives a, and the student asks questions, for example, or, or asks for something saying, please, I would like to buy two tickets to Paris or, or whatever, or to Almaty. And the teacher responds. But the teacher, or, uh, uh, sorry, the avatar responds. And the avatar as well is both playing the role of the somebody of, of the of the tourist guide but also is the teacher because they can say you you asked fairly correctly but you used the wrong word here or your pronunciation wasn't very good or i didn't understand at all what you were trying to say and that tutorial dialogue can either be in the language which the student is trying to learn <clears throat> or it can be in that student's first language so you can have the you can have the notion of a dual language interaction, the language that you're trying to learn in which you're practicing, but the language from a teacher in the language that you know who can explain about what was wrong in how you did things, uh, and it's it's very capable, uh, it's quite lifelike, and it's so far advanced uh, compared to uh, early systems in its ability to understand both well-spoken language as well as poorly constructed language and to be able to understand what 
the student was trying to say in a poorly constructed sentence. You know, I mean, building systems that can understand well-spoken sentences, I wouldn't say it was easy, but it's easier than trying to have systems that understand what you meant to say in poorly structured sentences. Next slide, please. So I'm going to give an example. All the previous examples were learner-centered. They were aimed at learners. But of course, human teachers needed to ensure that they were used effectively. So I'm going to now give an example of a teacher-centered system. Next slide, please. So the context in which this system uh, was used, it's called Lumilo uh, by Ken Holstein and his colleagues. The students, you can see them in the bottom left of the screen, are all sitting individually at computer terminals working on a tutor. For example, the cognitive tutor doing stuff in algebra. So in addition to uh, the uh, teaching system managing the individual interactions about algebra, it's also keeping track of the learning behavior of the students. And if you look carefully, I hope you can see it, you'll see that floating above the heads of the students are symbols. So in the top left of the screen, you can see there's a, uh, an orange question mark hovering over the head of the student with dark hair. And in the bottom uh, right of the screen, you can see uh, a yellow hand up uh, from a student wearing headphones, dark hair and white headphones. What's the role of the teacher? The teacher is on the right-hand side of the screen in the classroom, and she's wearing special spectacles which allow her to see the, those uh, apparently hovering symbols. Of course, they're not really hovering there in the classroom. They're really only hovering in the spectacles of the teacher. So she can see uh, what the students are doing. So can we go to the next slide, please? So here we have the menu of the different things. So the big question mark uh, is uh, what's called unproductive persistence, i.e. the student is really working hard, uh, but not really getting anywhere. You know, they're paying attention, they're trying their best, but they're not really ma making any progress. The little, qu that's the bottom, uh, question mark. The one immediately above it, hint avoidance, the student is working, but they're avoiding using the hint system which is available to give themselves help. That seems silly because the system's able to give all kinds of interesting and helpful help, but they're, they're, fa they're failing to use it. The little question mark above that again, high lo local error, um, uh, that is a case where uh, the, the student is making a lot of errors. Okay. Uh, and then the others go right to the top, um, the, the z -z -z -z, uh, symbol, the student is idle. They're not doing anything at all. And others too. So can we go to the next slide, please? So in a similar way to the other systems in term involving what the teacher does, they need to motivate the students to use that tutor, need to manage their prior activity and to structure and manage the interaction. But the extra thing here, which I put in red, is that the human teacher now has a way 
to choose who to help. Now, if you were a teacher, you might make a different decision, but it is the teacher's decision. Should they help the person who's completely stuck first, or should they help the person who is working hard but not making uh, and who, uh, not making any progress, or help the person who is idle? But this gives the teacher a sense of how well things are going so that they can then decide how to use their time. Their time is the big scarce resource in the classroom. And by giving the teacher a sense of the progress of each child, then the teacher can decide who is in most need of, of her help. Next slide, please. All right, so little recap. I've tried to give a sense about what is AI in education. I've tried to give a brief history of AI in education spanning the first 40 years or so. Um, I've kind of indicated the generic strengths in terms of uh, uh, learner-centered and teacher-centered uh, systems about what they do and also what the roles are um, uh, that teachers need to play. And you'll notice that I'm always very strong on the idea that the person in charge of the classroom is the human teacher and the systems are there to be effective assistants. But sometimes it's the teacher that needs to take total charge and, and ignore the assistants. So I want to move on to a different topic, which is to look at some evaluations of effectiveness of these kinds of systems and after that say something about ethics and generic dangers so let's um, oh you have already moved on excellent <laughs> so in the 1980s bloom and his colleagues looked at how effective uh, different kinds of teaching were uh, in ordinary classrooms, but this is not involving AI or even educational technology. So what they found was that in a conventional classroom, if you looked at the final exam scores or the final test scores of the students, they typically formed some kind of Gaussian curve with a few students scoring really badly, a few students scoring really well, and the bulk of the students coming out around average, uh, an average mark. And what he found when, or they found rather, when they looked at a, a, a classroom in which a mastery learning technique was applied, that when you then looked at the final exam score, the the, 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 it was still a few students scoring badly, a few students scoring well, but the, more, the, the, the overall scores had all shifted upwards, i.e. to the right-hand side in, in, in this graph. And the, and the peak of the Gaussian were, had a higher score than in the previous case. And then they compared that again with students being taught one-to-one -one, uh, by a mentor, a, a, a very effective mentor. And that had a further effect of shifting the distribution further to the right with the peak higher up, with more students uh, scoring higher than the other two. And uh, basically the two sigma means that the difference between one-on-one -on -one mentorship and a conventional classroom was roughly two standard deviations, hence two sigma. Now this, I mean, it's disputed about whether uh, Bloom actually did really find that or whether he had misinterpreted the data, but whether that's correct or not, it was adopted by people in AI and education as a kind of benchmark to try to aim for that if a human mentor could move the score of so many students 
to a better place, surely that should be the goal of an AI system working one to one with a, 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 a student too. So, so it became a kind of totemic uh, idea in AI and education to try to, to emulate this two sigma improvement in, uh, in effectiveness. Next slide, please. Now, there have been quite a lot of meta-analyses which have looked at a large number of different comparative exper experiments of AI in education systems. And they've looked at two different kinds of comparison. They've compared AI systems compared to classroom teaching, which is shown as a green bar. And they've shown AI systems compared to one-to-one uh, -one human tutoring. Um, and there have been a hundred, in the meta-analyses and, and meta-reviews, which I looked at, there were 182 different comparisons of comparing AI ed systems against classroom teaching. And basically, AI ed systems came out at around 0.5 of a standard deviation, an effect size of 0.5. So not the two sigma that was hoped for, but half a sigma, but still better than the ordinary classroom teaching. But when comparing AI systems with a skilled human teacher working one-to-one, -one, the skilled human teacher came out better. So AI ed systems were one-fifth minus 0 0.2 worse than the human teacher. And, and I guess that is pretty much where we are today. I mean, I did this work in 2016. Um, but basically, the, the take home story is that using an AI ed system effectively, you do get some benefits for sure. Trying to emulate giving every child in the class a, an individual, very expert teacher, you're not going to do as well as every child having a human teacher to themselves. Not very surprising, but also kind of good for, good for human morale too, I think. Next slide. So I'm into the last part of the talk. And there are some ethics and I think generic dangers. And the, and the ethics really have come about to, largely because of the very large amounts of data um, which are generated by educational technology systems in general and AI ed systems in particular. And also for AI ed systems, the data that is collected uh, uh, in building the AI ed system these days. So the big question always is, who owns and controls the data collected by ed tech systems? So there you are in your classroom uh, in Astana, learning about algebra, and it's keeping a check on how well each student is doing um, and maybe even what the teacher is doing, that data is collected somewhere, stored somewhere. Who's got access to it? Who can delete it? Who else gets to see it other than the school? These are all big questions. And in many countries, there's a worry about these kinds of issues, but there really aren't yet the effective controls to ensure that the people who generate the data actually have proper control over it. So that's one kind of generic danger, which is really to do with educational technology um, in, the, in general and not just AI ed. A second danger is to do with the way that, that contemporary AI ed systems operate, which is typically to collect a lot of data about students in order to build models. And then when they're being used to collect more data about the students, 
that are using that system, which was originally built on other students' data. And there are lots of ways that bias can creep in to these models. One way is, if, for example, if the data is collected on one kind of student, uh, uh, but is only used on another kind of student. So for example, imagine that you're using a system built in the USA, collected on USA students. It's then exported to Kazakhstan, where the maths curriculum is different, um, expectations are different, and the model then tries to be used on Kazakhstani students, but actually it'll, it's based on understanding American students. So there's going to be bias there, which may not work well for Kazakhstani students. Another kind of bias is where the data doesn't pay attention to uh, things it should or, pay, or, or does pay attention to things it shouldn't. So for example, you have bias that if the data is collected, let's say, a, a predominantly on male students, but is then used on mixed classrooms, it might be to the disadvantage of female students because male students and female students don't always behave in the same, exactly the same way. And there are plenty of examples of bias in AI systems in general, particularly things like systems which are using face recognition, uh, where, for example, people with darker skin can be discriminated against because the systems are much less able to deal with that because they've been trained on people with lighter skin. Um, there are all kinds of other biases that creep into AI in general. So there's a huge issue about how bias can be reduced in the first place in producing the models, but also in the way that those models actually operate. A third generic danger is that big tech companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, and their like, see an advantage in going into education, not particularly because they are, uh, are interested in educating the world's young, but because these are potentially future customers. So in collecting data about the individuals as students, they can then use it for later advertising to the same people as, peop uh, 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 as citizens. So there's a big issue about should we allow big tech companies to gather data on students, which will then be used for purposes other than education. And of course, uh, as, uh, as Tatiana at, at the very start mentioned, ChatGPT is here. Uh, it's problematic in terms of what it, can, what it can do and how it might be used, both by students who might be using it to answer exam questions or to write essays, um, by teachers who might ask for ChatGPT to generate some useful questions or to generate some text for students to use. But ChatGBT, it produces very plausible text, but it doesn't really understand anything. It's a device for, for putting one word after another in a plausible way. And it does it very convincingly, but it hallucinates. It makes up things. So, for example, if you ask it to justify uh, the use of AI in education, for example, it'll write a nice essay about that, and then it will have references at the end, and they look like references. They have an author, a date, a title, a journal name, a volume, and page numbers, because it understands how a reference look, how, how a reference looks, but it might be completely fictitious. So the teacher who uses chat GPT has the task then of deciding what is truth and what is nonsense from chat GPT. So that kind of is an extra task for the teacher. And of course, chat GPT has been let loose on the whole world and everybody, well, almost everybody has had a chance to 
um, to see it either at first or second hand. And everybody's woken up to AI in education. But as I pointed out, it's already, it's already 50 years old. And ChatGPT has taken over the discussion about education and the use of AI, but it's not the only tool, which is the, the, one of my main points that I've tried to make. But it is a worrisome one because of its plausibility. Um, one way to think about it is when an opera singer sings in a second language, so, so let's say a Russian opera singer singing an Italian opera in Italian, not knowing what the words mean, but singing in perfect Italian, apparently, understanding nothing, that's a bit like GPT, uh, chat GPT telling you about something. It doesn't under really understand it. It's just stuff, it's just words that it's learned to string together. Next slide, please. So thinking about bias, because AI in education, I think that's one of the big issues and the consequences of it, or the possible consequences of it. So going back to my tripartite distinction between learner-centered, teacher-centered, and administration-centered AI systems, for learner-centered systems, if there's bias in how the system understands the student or students it's working with, that can lead to non-optimal teaching. Now, I have to say, as, a, as a, somebody who's been a teacher, I have to own up to having often produced non-optimal teaching. And I know my colleagues as teachers have often produced non-optimal teaching. It's not great, but it's not the end of the world. If we look at teacher-centered systems, for example, the Lumilo system, which I told you about, if the system makes a wrong judgment about a child, about whether they should, be, should get help or not, um, that can be a bit problematic. So let's take the case where the child is doing really well, um, in fact, so well that they get finished and then are sitting there doing nothing because they finished whatever the task was, the system might say this child is idle. And the teacher, having been told that, uh, needs to, would, might go over and say, well, you haven't done very well. You know, you, you've been, you, you, you know, you haven't been, you haven't been busy. But the child has been busy. They're so good. They've got it all done. So, you know, that might annoy the child. But again, that's not too bad an issue because the child can explain, no, I have I got it all done. Can I have something more challenging to do? However, if we think of the case where a child has been uh, not really working very effectively at all, getting things wrong, uh, getting bored, and the system says, this child is working fine, don't need to help that, that child, the teacher giving that wrong advice will ignore the child. And I think that is definitely problematic because the child actually needs help and the help isn't being given because the teacher has been badly advised by a biased system. So that's kind of worse in a way than non-optimal teaching. It's like non-engagement of the teacher with that child. And then if we come to the third category, which are administration-centered systems, if, if they're involved, for example, in, in admissions, and they make a judgment that this, per, this applicant isn't good enough to, to, to do this course or to enter this institution, and they made it on the basis of a biased judgment, that means a, a whole educational opportunity could, could be denied. Of course, it, they might also go the other way and admit students who shouldn't be admitted because they're not strong enough. Um, and, but both those are, are really damaging. So if we look at the next slide, please. The, 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 the danger, the consequences of bias 
and the degree of harm, I think, gets greater as we move down through learner-centered, through teacher-centered, to administration-centered systems, that the overall, the, the harm to an individual is likely to be the largest at systems aimed at administrators than it is at, uh, for systems aimed at individual learners in general terms. Okay, next slide, please. So just to recap, and this, uh, not, this is my next but one sl last slide. I've tried to give you a sense of where AI has come from, about what it's good at doing, what it's not so good at doing. I've given you three or four ex explicit examples of the use of largely, but not wholly, symbolic AI. Uh, Lumilo, for example, uses machine learning. And I've also tried, because it's a teacher audience, I've tried to explain what the role of the teacher is in each case, and to emphasize that the human teacher's role is very important, indeed crucial, in all of those systems. I've told you a little bit about the evaluations of the effectiveness of these systems, which are broadly positive compared to an ordinary classroom uh, run by one teacher and many students. But uh, AI ed systems aren't yet uh, as good as a teacher working one to one, a skilled teacher working one to one with an individual child. And then I've also given you a hint as towards the ethical dilemmas and generic dangers that AI ed systems pose. And I know uh, from my looking at the program for your later talks in this series that these issues of ethics and chat GPT in particular are being covered in much more detail by other speakers. So I was asked to talk for an, uh, around uh, an hour, which I have, and I'll leave you with uh, a slide uh, which gives a reference, uh, a, a real reference, not a chat GPT a hallucinated reference to uh, the papers that describe the systems that I've described. And I've added um, at the bottom three of my own pieces of work. So I've just published a handbook of artificial intelligence in education uh, with two co-editors. It's a big, it's an expensive, it's a book for the library rather than for an individual, but it does cover the whole of AI in education, its history and the different aspects of it. There's a little small book that I wrote with a colleague called AI for Learning, which is cheap paperback and aimed at, aimed at teachers uh, about how to think about AI in education. Uh, and uh, uh, for the evaluation of AI in education, um, this is the paper I wrote in 2016, the bottom one on this list uh, uh, about artificial intelligence as an effective classroom assistant. Thank you very much for listening, for, um, and I'm very happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Professor Deby, for your presentation and for providing the background of AI, and certainly our participants have questions to you. And I would start with this question. During the presentation, you showed how AI assesses the penetration into the material. The question is, what? how does the AI do it? Uh, uh, does it? Does it benchmark it with the, its own database or the database uh, for benchmarking is uh, uploaded by uh, the tutor, by the teacher? Who should do it? Um, well, typically, the amount of complexity in building an AI ed system means that it will be the it will be the builders of the system 
on advice from the teachers who will build this who will build the the domain knowledge into the system um in the case of the cognitive tutors um the, there are really two different kinds there are two different sorts of domain knowledge there is the domain knowledge about what an expert would do in solving an algebraic problem in the case of algebra say and that is built up in a set of rules uh, called production rules which essentially encode all of the individual skills of an expert algebra problem solving person but they also include skills which are the ones which are exhibited by uh, by students too both correct skills produced by students and incorrect skills by students so they do a big analysis ahead of ahead of the system being built so that they can recognize when a particular human student is doing something correct which other students would do and also incorrect which other students have been shown to do as incorrect but all of that kind of building of these production rules is a complicated business so you if you if you want to if you want to as an individual teacher in an individual school you buy the algebra tutor then basically it comes with the domain knowledge and it's not very easy for the individual teacher to upload uh, their own variety um, of algebra or algebra skills so basically it's part of the it's part of the building of the system rather than something that the teacher can do can do i hope that answers your question yes thank you very much for answering it there's another question ai uh, distributes uh, individual tasks or unified tasks or this is decided and uh, these tasks are given by the teacher um well it's it, did you say uh, uh, individual uh, uh, tasks? Individual, yeah, individual tasks. Uh, okay. Are they individual or universal? Common for uh, all. Uh, it depends on the system. Um, so, for example, the the cognitive tutors has a very big set of tasks that it can give, and each student will be offered a different one of those uh, those tasks depending on their progress so a student that is progressing quickly will move quite quickly to more complex tasks and the student who is who's working more slowly will move more slowly and get easier tasks so the kind of task that uh, is offered depends on the individual student uh, so it's it's not quite it's not quite as you asked the question it's you know the, the idea is that the student each student gets a sequence of tasks which is optimized for that student to make the fastest progress that that is possible for that student thank you very much there's another question it is about their presentation. Our audience are wondering. You were showing the slide with foreign teachers, uh, and they had uh, a, a choice. Uh, and uh, who foreign teachers prefer, or who do they choose to help to? Probably depends. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not really uh, uh, clear on what the question is. I'm sorry. Could you ask it again and maybe in different words? Yes, there was a slide. Yes. Showing that the teacher determined whom to help. Oh, yes, yes. When yes. working with the AI. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So when, when we speak about foreign teachers, who they help, first of all, well that's an interesting question that may be a a, a cultural issue um that uh, in some in some schools 
uh, the teacher might always prefer to help the best students who actually need the least help. In other schools, the teacher might prefer to work with the students who need help the most. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's to do with the culture of the pedagogy in that particular classroom. Um, I mean, I, I, uh, when I was a teacher, I tended to work with the, the, the children who needed the most help because I knew that, largely speaking, the kids who could do it, do stuff well, wouldn't cause trouble and would get on with what they were supposed to do. Whereas if I ignored the kids who were finding difficulties, they would cause trouble. Uh, and so in, in terms of my self-preservation and peace of mind, it was actually quite a sensible strategy to work with the kids who needed the most help because they, that made my life the easiest. Clear, thank you. You have a very humane pedagogical approach. Thank, Thank you. you, Professor Dubilly. We dare to ask one more. The system adopts uh, to the language proficiency level. If we speak about foreign languages, yes, uh, you said uh, about that. So is it about every individual skill, uh, like uh, A1 or A2 level, or is it only within the framework of the set uh, uh, language level like A1. So will this system uh, choose uh, several levels or the tutor would uh, uh, set one tier uh, uh, of, of learning for the whole group? Um, I would need to um, uh, uh, I would need to check with Lewis Johnson exactly to answer your question. But like the uh, like the cognitive tutor, the system will uh, adjust itself to some extent to the student that is working with it. So if the it, it may be wishing the student to reach a particular level, but if the student is showing that they can't get there, it will react to the student at the level that they are. Um, in the hope that if it works with the student for long enough, they'll reach the, the more advanced level. Thank you. So it adjusts and adopts. Okay. And now the question is, uh, which is interesting to those uh, teachers uh, who are concerned about the adaptivity of AI and how AI adopts, uh, adjusts, knowledge to, to children. So both data on the child is needed for the system in order to, to realize what to do with the child, how the system gathers, collects this data and information. Well, different, different systems gather different kinds of data, but typically they will look at um, the success uh, or failure on the task that has been set. If they're capable of looking at the individual steps in the task, they will look to see which individual steps have uh, been done correctly and which have been done incorrectly. They will look at how much time the student takes on individual steps and on the whole problem. They will look at the degree to which the child uses the help system embedded in the system to seek help. They will look to see whether they seem to have read the help that they've been given and made use of it. They will check to see whether they seem to be playing games with the system to persuade the system to give the answer by playing dumb. Uh, so they look at a whole range of factors to try and make the best guess they can at how much help and what kind of task should be the next one and what kind of feedback should be provided. So, for example, if they think that the child is guessing all the answers, answering very quickly and not really paying any attention whatsoever, 
then the feedback might be about what works in terms of learning things that you're not going to learn much if all you do is guess and and don't even try so it might be highly metacognitive feedback if 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 the child is is broadly uh doing very well the the reaction might be to um, make the problems quite a lot harder to be more challenging um, if the child is doing doing poorly it might be to invite them to make more use of the help it might be to make the the the, the problem the tasks easier so there's both a range of inputs to the system um, and a range of possible reactions by the system to what it, it finds. And uh, these days, people are building systems to look at uh, classroom groups or, or groups within classrooms. Um, and if they're concerned that the kids should be working collaboratively and they spot that. Uh, one of the children doesn't collaborate, all the others collaborate, then it might intervene to say to the others, look, you know, uh, you nobody's talking to Mary. Please, can you include her in the discussion? Or if they find that one student is dominating the discussion, uh, let's say Peter, they may say to Peter, look, Peter, we know you're a brilliant chap, but can you shut up for a bit? The others want to have a chance to talk. You know, so depending on the on the nature of the task and the interactions between the students, there's quite a lot that can be can be gathered uh, in order to decide how the teacher should react, either about the topic or about the behaviour of the students. Thank you very much. Indeed, this is a very interesting topic. And uh, we have been getting lots of questions. Maybe we will leave these, some of these questions to our next presenter because our time with you comes to an end. And uh, I would like to ask you a traditional question, which we usually ask in our course, uh, Professor Deby. It's about the future of AI. What is going to be next? Um, uh, I think we're going to calm down about chat GPT, okay, that uh, it, it's been a bit of a surprise. Um, people are getting you know, quite fretful and worried about it, uh, but I think things will, will calm down. Um, and that the kinds of system that I've talked about that preceded chat GPT will continue to thrive and do useful work in the classroom. I also think that it's increasingly understood that these systems are not there to replace human teachers. Human teachers are crucial to making any system work. You can't just dump the kids in a warehouse with laptops and, and, and say, come back when you're 18, you will have learned everything from AI. It's just not feasible. Thank you. This is a good comparison, indeed. When we are getting this great uh, statement that nobody is to replace a human teacher, uh, it's so nice, but we have so many jobs. We are masters of all trade and we need assistance. And if AI becomes our assistant, our colleague uh, who will facilitate uh, development of children, and if we work in a pair with AI, it's going to be great. Yes. And I you, believe uh, that remember, our participants would agree. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. But remember who's boss? It's the human who is the boss and the AI is the assistant. Indeed. Thank you so much. This is a great statement. Indeed. Ba boss is a person in a class who is a teacher. Well, or, or students, you decide, uh, depending on the model of your teaching. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Professor DeBee. All the best to you.
be Thank healthy, you. Uh, prosper, and we are wishing yes. you to publish new books. And we are looking forward uh, to follow your studies. And we can't wait to see more outcomes of your efforts. Thank you very much and uh, see you in the future. Thank you.